that is fine. Anyway, um, this is just like a very brief uh, presentation of the project. Um, it's called the Wounded Matrix, and uh, it's about uh, fault lines of artificial creativity, which um, for us implies uh, spaces of human machine uh, machine machine human collaboration in which um, we find areas of resistance, pieces of friction, uh, undecidability, areas of uh, like abysmal emptiness or um, overload. And um, the invitation to artists um, followed this idea that we should open the conversation in the form of an exhibition to those that are collaborating with machines, but also uh, in, in that capacity, um, locating spaces um, for these fault lines to, to open and for their work to inhabit or to map. And so, um, yeah, Rosa and I worked on the, on the exhibition as, um, as, as, a, as a conversational space if you will. And uh, maybe, Rosa, you want to say something about um, the project or, uh, yeah, or we can start hearing the artists as you prefer. Yes, perhaps uh, as well. Thank Muchas gracias, Mariajo, y todo el equipo de la UPV, porque ha sido un placer también eh, montar la exposición aquí con, con vosotras. Ha sido un lujo y al equipo de montadores también. Um, so, um, as Manuel was saying, I, I became part of the team uh, already for the exhibition, but I think it's important to say that uh, um, this project has been a, a research project for, for a while uh, with other people involved that are also in the, in the audience that perhaps want to say something later, but perhaps we can start, you can start explaining us about this uh, the whole research and how did it uh, arrive? Like, yeah. how did you you started with it? Well, it's true. Um, so yes, here uh, with us are uh, Carmen Montiel, Alex Viladric, and Maria Molina Costa. They're part of an Ideas team, and uh, specifically with Carmen and with Alex, we started four years ago, um, wondering about the fact that all these um, diverse technologies tools were appearing in which certain tasks could be accelerated or automated um, or optimized or whatever the language was used to, um, to, to, to disseminate them. And, um, and, and these tools could um, suddenly, well, they appear to jeopardize the existence of certain roles in the creative industries. But as, as we saw the progress of these technologies, then we suddenly found that some of them were producing aesthetic objects. Um, sometimes they were called artworks. And we thought, well, it's not so much our interest uh, in understanding the, the aesthetic encoding or the rules about these objects, but rather to see how um, as artists or designers or architects or creative people or um, poets, musicians, we could find the spaces in, um, in which operating was still relevant. And these spaces were like on the margins of our bodies to a certain extent. And uh, also in the spaces in which uh, what was produced by, by machines suddenly presented like mirages or, or, or phantasmatic bodies or body effects or somatic processes or representations. And so basically what you see here on, uh, on the screen is part of a system, a graphic system that we developed to um, build portraits of uh, each of the people we were interviewing. We're starting conversations with to understand uh, how their creative practice was developed um, in friction or in relation with a, a certain economic context, a certain discourse, certain categorization as specialists or scientists or researchers, um, how much uh, certain elements that are hard to quantify like pain or solitude were important in their practice. We started a qualitative study this way and uh, 
um, some artists participate at the stage, some designers from our community. In the, at the time, we were focusing on any practice because this fear was developed and generalized uh, across the board. Um, but some artists were already working with, uh, with these means. John was an early participant. Uh, John Menick um, was an early participant in, in these conversations way before the exhibition. And so, um, again, to go back to what Rosa was saying about the wonderful team here at the Politecnica de Valencia, we um, then started talking to Salome Cuesta and to Maria Jose about the possibility of an exhibition. This seemed like a, a good exhibition to, uh, to tackle uh, or a good project to tackle with the language of an exhibition. And so uh, that's like the, yeah, the second stage of the project in which Rosa uh, came on board as well. And um, yes, and then we started working on this as um, like a development in which the works would give us much more than what our, you know, like scholarly study would uh, produce at the time. Though I think all the works kind of, um, yeah, I mean, like they, they expand beyond this, the discursive space of the show, but at the same time they enrich it. And that's where we are now, just about to open the exhibition and, and to see all these materials, which include also documents from our own research in, in the exhibition. So uh, the work of uh, Carmen, Alex, Mireya, uh, and, and ourselves is, is there too, as just documentation. And so, yeah, but maybe we can introduce the artist, Rosa, and. Uh, and uh, just like hear them talk about their work, like maybe just like a short intro, if everybody agrees. Yes, so here on, a, on the table, oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, the, the exhibitions has uh, this, the artist's name here, Itziar Barrio, who's not here, Laia Struck, Zach Blas, Sara Derat, who is on there on the table, Elisa uh, Giardini, Papa, John Menig, uh, who's also here uh, with us, Katarina Petrovic, and, uh, and Mark Vives, who just arrived and is in the audience that perhaps can, can also be part of the conversation. So perhaps we have some visuals, we could go through the works. Yes, um, let's see. Um, oh, here you see the chart of this, um, like uh, profiling we did with the seven vectors. Um, so I was mentioning, you know, like the, the element of uh, penetration into the institutional tissue, dependence on equipment, um, isomorphism between forms of research, uh, market value, cultural value, um, capacity to impact the, the heteropatriarchal anthropophagocentric world, um, specialization. These were like the indicators that we use for for this portrait system. Here you see an image of one of these uh, Blender uh, models um, and how it was presenting already like the features, uh, the, the salient aspects of uh, one of the profiles we were um, having a conversation with. And uh, this is also one of the testers, a uh, beautiful watercolor that was then uh, converted to to black and white, almost looks like a uh, charcoal drawing, but it's originally a watercolor by Carmen Montiel. And um, this, this fear comes really often in, in the show. It's actually quite interesting. We did not seek for, you know, spheres or circular figures or anything like that, but suddenly there's a lot of them. Uh, in this particular case, it's Katarina Petrovic's work. And uh, Katarina, maybe I can, did you give an intro? There's one image uh, per screen in, in your installation, which has three screens. And maybe you can give us a little bit of context about um, the way it came together from your research. Um, at the bottom. Okay. Uh, can I see what is the next image? Sorry, no. Okay. These are the three images. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the invitation and for the hospitality. Uh, I think uh, I'm also very much surprised with the works and how everything comes together in this uh, exhibition. So yeah, okay, let me tell you a bit about the work uh, that you can see in the gallery here. What we're looking at, it is um, 
a very rudimentary uh, simplification of how does uh, artificial intelligence clip model by OpenAI uh, embed different colors. Okay, so let me unpack this a little bit. Uh, we, uh, the, the current models that we are using to generate images or text, uh, they, when we're using AI to generate images, they are based on texts, right? So you go and write a prompt so that you would get an image. These models are based on the idea that language, the same as an image, can be embedded into a vector space or differently words and images can be represented through numbers and through vector spaces they can be encoded and once we encode them we can create the relationships between words and images so uh, in the work I developed with Studio Render, which is a studio for creative coding in The Hague, where I am based, we were investigating the idea of teaching an AI, a large language model, to negate. And uh, negation is a very uh, creative thing to do. Uh, we don't have time to go into it, but I, if you are interested in uh, the, my overarching project on negation, we can talk about it later. So we were trying to uh, teach a machine to creatively negate by using oppositions in colors. So we said, take an example of black is to white like a cat is to, so continue the sequence. And so that's how the idea for this came up. How about we use a model that will use both colors and words to find oppositions the same way we do that in color theory. So if we go to the next image, Manuel, thank you. Here we see that effectively we created a dictionary where words and, num uh, and colors uh, match together, they stand together. Basically, we use the 12-bit RGB space, which is 4,096 different colors and an entire English dictionary. And we asked a clip model to uh, make an embedding. And so essentially the words that are matched to the colors, and this was the question that came up quite a bit, is by proximity. Because in this embedded space, in this vector space uh, that is very foreign to us, we have 512 dimensions. And so each of these objects, be it a word or a color, stands in proximity to each other. So the closer they are, the more likely that they are uh, meaningfully connected. So these are the proximities, essentially. And then through this uh, spherical mapping, we look for opposition, a polar opposite. And in the end, this created a new method where through looking up colors, we could look up uh, different word negations. And so we could make the machine jump out of its programmed behavior and look for more creative ways to uh, negate through a series of color encodings, essentially. So the machine becomes creative by producing anomalies to the initial instructions of, you know, like following associations? Uh, no, I would say the machine follows the instructions very precisely. But the, the instructions here were a bit off in a way that they are, um, uh, how, sh how should I say? They don't follow the geometry uh, of the system, they propose a new geometry to the system. So, so yeah. And, and how is the new geometry created um, in that process? So, we were wondering really, this is, uh, I mentioned this to you before, when you work with AI, it's a black box. You simply do not know what happens there. 
And the more complex these language models are, the more difficult it is for us to understand what happens there. So when we want to understand when we want to grasp this idea that there is a geometry to which a machine is acting upon, you can forget it that you will ever know what that geometry is. You will never know. The best you can do is you can set up a new uh, prompt to simplify that geometry for you to understand. But it's not that geometry. So when we um, when we propose ours, we are really proposing a very simple method, which is like take this super complex structure, um, how do you say, uh, collapse it into two dimensions. So collapse 512 dimensions to two, wrap them on a sphere and look for its opposite. Yeah. Mm. But a sphere is three dimensional in principle, no? So, like, I mean, like this, you're going into a territory that's very familiar to you, but not necessarily for us or, like, you know, somebody who comes and see your work. So, when you speak of 512 dimensions, this is based on a certain, like, dimensional scale in which you're working, or where does it come from? Uh, the, the dimensionality comes from the model you decide to use. So, essentially, um, the clip model has 512 dimensions, but some other models and the, the ones we've built so far, they go up to 3000. And that complexifies actually your output. It means that the model is more uh, intelligent. Yeah, and so when you look at the color chart here, one of the questions we had, you know, as we were looking at your piece was, okay, it's based on complementary or polar opposition, but you see very similar colors that appear on both ends of each figure. How, how do you explain that? Are they contrary colors in any polar system? I don't know. Uh, they could be. They could be, but every time you run this code, because the, the models here that we use, they are updated through use. So it learns by using the, the model. So if we would redo this work, which we originally made in, uh, like in September 2023, the models are already much better. The, the months in here are... Uh, a long time, um, we would get a different color space. So that would mean we would get different kinds of oppositions. So this is a snapshot in time for an AI a a color text. Yeah, and so to look at the third uh, like aspect of your installation, the third screen, you see a poem that is mutating um, to a certain length like there's like a number of mutations that occur until it resets and uh, those mutations are based on the fact that some words are taken the color equivalent is found then it moves on to the you know like word color 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 word word yeah. word and so how does it work exactly for this poem by wonderful audrey lord well like like i mentioned i think it's a very simple uh, idea uh, it is. It, it was an experiment to see if going out of language with an AI, uh, working with color and coming back to language, will you get some more creative solutions? Uh, and in this case, it's instead of antonymization, so instead of taking a word and looking up in the diction dictionary if you have the antonym or not, which is another work I also, I try that. Here, uh, we look for an antonym or if it, uh, in, we look for its color opposite. So uh, essentially, uh, there is no grammar uh, or uh, syntax uh, adjustments to the, sent uh, to the sentences. So you uh, effectively, in the end, get uh, nonsense, which I would also say it's a marking of creativity. Thank you. Um, so let's see what's waiting us throughout. Whoa. John Menick's work uh, is quite um, representative of the project uh, we started as, as let's say, as, as an expression of 
what uh, at, a, at a different occasion I called uh, like ra a radically analog attitude applied to digital realities. Um, John, you work a lot with film, but you've also worked a lot with computing, with programming. You're very knowledgeable in the area of uh, like uh, knowledge as structured by machines and, and also feeling encoded in what we may call fiction, which is in, its, in itself is a technology. And um, when we proposed you to show this work here, it was also with a um, somewhat perverse uh, idea that we knew this is not a work generated or related to AI, but however, it is deeply connected to your kind of uh, perception of this much machinic or mechanic kind of uh, thinking processes. This is uh, how to tell a story kind of, uh, you know, like serious development. Um, and it's, I would say, a really, um, I think, crucial uh, reflection on generalization. And uh, yeah, what can you tell us about this body of work? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you guys for inviting me. And uh, maybe can I can I control the button? Can I, can I, all right. I'm, 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 I'm in control now. Um, so I just want to show you very quickly. Uh, these are uh, digital prints, uh, inkjet prints that are uh, hanging in the front wall of the gallery. Um, this is a work I started in 2009, so it's been ongoing for a while. Uh, they're both drawings and prints. Uh, so this is one, um, uh, this, I'll explain them in a moment. This is another that you'll see there. Um, and uh, this is a third. Uh, there's only three slides for each person, I, th right? I think there's, there's more. Is all five here? Okay, so there's this one as well. There's no order to them. And uh, this is the last. Uh, the, the series is called How to Tell a Story. And um, I uh, work in fiction. I write fiction. But my work, my visual artwork is also about fiction. And um, these are diagrams from books on how to write books. So um, these are, you know, how to write a screenplay, how to write um, an award-winning novel. Um, some are very specific, you know, like uh, how to write a romance novel. Others are very general, how to, you know, write great drama. Um, and uh, each is uh, sort of uh, related to, um, so some are very abstract and uh, some are very, uh, are pretty obvious as to what they're, they're diagramming. Um, so the, these are moments in the text when the author uh, has stopped writing and resorts to visual imagery to tell something about language. And that was really the prompt at the beginning for me to do this. Uh, but what was uh, interesting for me uh, and um, comes up in my work often is its relationship to um, the history of psychology and in particular self-help, um, the self-help industry. And, you know, I think of the self-help industry as being a particularly uh, American sort of creation um, was created by people like Daniel Carnegie and books like How to, how to, um, how to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, you know, I wrote about this, uh, this work for uh, Bomb Magazine, and um, I, I'm going to refer to that text a little bit here. You know, there's someone by the name of Napoleon Hill, who's a kind of lesser known figure in the self-help industry. And he was friends with Andrew Carnegie. And it was Andrew Carnegie who sort of recommended to him, you know, what made me rich and famous, this is Andrew Carnegie speaking, uh, what made me rich and famous is anybody could do. You just have to reduce it to uh, a number of rules. And as long as people follow those rules, you too could be Andrew Carnegie. And so um, Napoleon Hill became kind of like Carnegie's uh, 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 sort of stenographer, but ended up writing dozens and dozens of books. Some of the, here are some of the titles, The Laws of Success, The Magic Ladder to Success, uh, Think and Grow Rich, uh, You Too Could Own, Could Work Miracles. Um, you know, so this industry, uh, very American, comes out of the early 20th century, um, relates strongly to a kind of Protestant work ethic. Um, and, uh, but by the end of the century, 
it has developed into a whole, or has expanded into a whole host of different fields. One of which is uh, the arts, and um, and uh, we're probably most aware of things like how to write an award-winning screenplay or or um, how to write a best-selling novel. Um, and I was interested in how um, the self-help industry, but also I, I would call it the kind of American rational Protestant ethic believes that all success can be reduced to an algorithm and that things like social context, uh, race, gender, history, et cetera, those things don't matter. As I'm speaking as, as a writer of one of these books, what really matters is understanding what makes something good and doing, you know, just fulfilling that mandate. Um, I do make work about artificial intelligence and I have made work about artificial intelligence going back quite a bit before even large language models and diffusion models and so forth. Um, it's strange, this isn't one of them, um, but when writing about it um, in 2016 for this bomb article, I related it to um, one of these Silicon Valley uh, organizations called the, the Center for Applied Rationality. And it's one of these, um, the people who put it together are some of whom were ex AI researchers, they believe that uh, CEOs in Silicon Valley um, could pretty much uh, do anything uh, if they just applied good, clean rationality to the problem. Um, and I think this is something that's really endemic in uh, AI culture in general and computer culture in general, general, which is that, you know, the algorithm rules above all. And, um, you know, there really is no magic to making art. There really is no talent to making art. It just simply is an algorithm waiting to be discovered. Um, it um, doesn't just apply to things like uh, generating pictures of cats, but also to, you know, a, um, writing a hip hop song. Um, you know, um, Hollywood's been interested in um, AI since at least the late nineties in terms of trying to figure out how to predict whether or not a movie will uh, become a success. Um, and of course, what's sitting behind all of this is this kind of maybe even Neoplatonist idea of, you know, there's there are rules kind of hovering out there in the ether and we just have to be smart enough to figure out what those rules are. Um, the messiness of history, of politics, of just pure contingency uh, has no role in any of this stuff. Um, so yeah, I think that's really, would you leave it there? What you're presenting is like some sort of extension of Max Weber's uh, work on the spirit of the, the Protestantism and, and the spirit of, uh, of capitalism, you know, like the, the, like Protestant uh, ethics and the spirit of capitalism it would be like the AI ethics and the spirit of, you know, like whatever, cognitive success. Cap success AI, 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 the spirit of success this is what yes doing. certainly but i think it's really interesting that you're you're presenting this idea of algorithm based creativity even successful creativity meaning you know like talent or genius in terms of effect as something stemming from the from the protestant ethic but what's, what's interesting also is that i would say there's a strong for anyone in the room who's who has spent any time in the arts, there's also a strong sort of Marxist critique of creativity that's very similar. You know, that, that you know, talent and genius and these things don't really exist, that really it's, you know, for Marxists, it would be social forces, but, you know, um, that really um, the demystification of the artistic process is something that you're seeing happening across the board. Um, whether you're, you know, someone who's following in the footsteps of Napoleon Hill writing these uh, self-help books, or you're an AI researcher saying anybody can make a Picasso now, or, you know, you're, um, you know, a Marxist critic who thinks, you know, or, or Joseph Boyce who thinks that in the future, everybody will be an artist. Um, you know, there is a kind of weird kind of cross political con you know, convergence of all this stuff. Yeah. Rosa, maybe you want to also share some thoughts. Yes, when I approached this uh, this work for the first time, for me it was as you were saying, like the kind of pre uh, like a precursor of uh, AI, this kind of uh, yeah um, kind of abstraction of certain ideas. But and uh, it makes me also, it made me also think about the 
when you don't know where it comes from and you see the the graphics they become quite yeah abstract and, and beautiful at the same time that uh, um, they can kind of suggest other uh, kind of uh, relations to it or, or it can create a kind of a like a plot or ideas for you so so it's uh yeah it's not only the the person that wrote it that has the um the plot but also when they are a part of the book like outside of the book being in an art exhibition for example they are really open for you know interpretation they are, they are quite emblematic in a way mm -hmm. so i think it um it also conveys like a uh, certain idea that is present in, for instance, suprematism, or like actually Marxist infused forms of uh, avant-garde in which they were, they would not, the artist would be like some sort of medium of some universals emerging through, you know, could be painting or sculpture. So in, in this sense, like here, it's like a very, uh, again, ironic, really strange idea of the medium, the medium of, you know, these formulas which are the formulas of success and ultimately um, Protestant forms of redemption in the world. Yeah, let me just say one last thing and then we can we can move on is that, um, you know, speaking to the philosophy of AI, this kind of thinking represents what was sometimes called good old fashioned AI, which is not in fashion anymore. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, in order to teach a computer how to write a book, you just have to, you know, come up with all the rules of writing a book and you program it into the computer and the computer therefore writes a book. You know, that turned out to be a really a blind alley or led to the sort of AI winter. And now with neural networks, you just simply have neural networks training on data, ideally in a way that's, uh, you know, in a way that's unguided, right? Um, it doesn't really have to understand uh, what a Picasso is. It just is a noise diffusion model that's, you know, kind of working its way back to what a Picasso is. But I still think lurking out there in the background, you know, is this kind of thinking somewhere. And I think there's going to be a moment where, you know, there's diminishing returns on things like diffusion models and so on. And even if it works out that diffusion models are all we need in order to create art, there still is this idea that, well, now everybody can be an artist. Right? Thank you, John. Um, we will like spread the conversation also, uh, among the room, um, as we see the, the works of our uh, artists here now, I want to jump to Sarah Derrett's work and uh, this beautiful dance performance that is present here in the form of a, of a video. There's also another screen uh, in which the dance movements are confronted with like geological and uh, ecologic forces. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell us a bit more about the performance and, and, and this two screen video that we're showing? Of course, yeah. Um, once again, uh, thank you everybody for having us. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So, um, yeah, I thought I need to go back to um, the beginning of this project, um, which is called Retrograde. Um, it, it is a sound installation, an immersive sound installation in 360, um, which was um, activated through a performance um, choreographed in collaboration with a London-based choreographer called Georgia Tegu. And you can see on the screen um, my performer, uh, Sina uh, Mari Lundesgaard, who I worked with. Um, so Retrograde is um, a, a huge project that stems from um, researching the Hertz core rotational uh, rhythm. So if you think about the Earth, um, it has a core that moves at a different speed than the rest of the, la the other layers of the Earth. Um, this cycle is still very unknown due to the impossibility of reaching the center of the Earth, obviously, but it is a fascinating um, force that has the ability of going against the grain in a sense that um, it can slow down, speed up, and also reverse. Um, the periodicity is estimated at this stage at about 70 years, which is a human lifespan, which also mattered in that research. Um, and I guess as an, as an artist, what really fascinated me in this, in this process is this idea of a, of a smaller force going against a grain, going against something much larger than itself. Um, and it has the 
um, it conveys the possibility for me of thinking about macro and micro and different scales, applying this to um, us versus geological forces, us versus technological bodies, because the work itself is really an exploration of um, blurred boundaries between technological, geological, um, human bodies and entities. Um, and um, yeah, so the, the sound piece is made with um, sort of like a poetic narrative that I've written, which talks about this idea of um, technological ac accelerationism. Um, and it is um, scored um, with an electronic musician and composer called Vincent Kavanagh, um, who works under the moniker, the moniker of the Radicant. Um, and the soundtrack is um, a mix of so electronic composition only um, produced with volcanic activity samples. So we took a lot of uh, scientific recordings and just played with them and turned them into rhythmical sounds. Um, and the narration itself is uh, partly done by myself and partly done with a synthesized version of my voice. So it is mixed in a way that is really difficult to decipher who's who and who's saying what. Um, it's a process that I've been developing in my practice for at least seven years, I think, working with different systems and different programs. Um, and I'm pretty, like, I was pretty mesmerized to see how fast um, the, the progress has gone in terms of the different evolution of my practice and see how from having a very robotic, with all its charm and its quirks seven years ago has now turned into something that sounds even more me than me. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so the, this, this sound piece was performed, as I said, with this fantastic choreographer and dancer. And the idea that I really had for, for this performance was to um, embody um, the cause rotation. So talking about synchronicity, asynchronicity in movement, um, balance, out of balance, axis being on and off axis, breaking the body into upper body, lower body, see how these things can rotate, counter rotate and other points of breakage. Um, and uh, the video that is presented is part of this choreography, like very important movements of this piece. Um, and they were, this, this, this video, her performance of those movements were filmed at the same time um, as this, um, sorry, this live stream um, of a volcano in Hawaii called uh, Kilauea. This volcano was funnily erupting the entire time that I was working on this project and it became a character in this project and it became an like an acolyte of, of, of the human body. Um, this, uh, this, this footage that you can see of the volcano um, is part of a, a live stream monitoring, a scientific monitoring of its activity. And um, they were both, the, the moments when we started to shoot um, the dancer, the performer, we just pressed play and record on that live stream. So um, in a sense, those bodies are summoning each other. Um, they are working with each other and breathing at the same time. So I, I think what, what was interesting is throughout this entire process, of making this uh, sound piece and then this video. What this video shows is really the undeniable and um, unsuppressible vibrancy of geological forces and human forces um, through the vehicle of technology. So. Forces which cannot be um, quantified. That's right. With precision. Yeah. And how do you connect? Because I remember the first encounter I had with your work was uh, as I mean, I, I saw your, your sculptures, which in some cases were sound sculptures too. Mm -hmm. And then we worked together on a VR uh, installation, also with the Radicant and other artists that were collaborating with you, with Vincent. And uh, and now you're moving towards an area that is more choreographic, but I think there's like a thread that connects everything. The, the VR work we did at the time was, um, let's say, um, the foundations of that work were, uh, AI and how AI can produce a certain type of text and how that can connect with a certain archaeology of culture. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you uh, tell that thread uh, in, in these works, uh, moving 
to what we see now as, as, as the mimetic and resistant encounter of geology and choreography. Right. Um, yes, that's right. It's it started with like the, the work you refer to had a lot to do with um, archaeology as well. Um, so I have a background in archaeology and art history. So it's something that is very much part of me um, and my education and um, in my roots, really. So I, I was really interested in, in this project um, that we did together back in Sonar in Barcelona um, to look at the development of, um, of tool making and language um, in, um, if you think about if the evolution of mankind and how um, those things have been very, very tied to each other, how the process of tool making has um, as an evolutionary impact on the brain and on our ability to develop words. And I was really questioning um, the, in that sense, the automation and those processes. Um, and progressively led me to the voice because obviously sound is a very important feature in my work. Um, but there's something about so unique about the voice and its composition and, and, and how much it evokes a single person, not only just the idea of being, not only like, there's something so, so unique and so personal that I just really wanted to touch on that personal um, thing. And um, with, uh, with Sonar, I worked um, with technologists on producing a musical um, call and response with an AI system. So the idea was to uh, take this very, foundational exercise in music composition and apply it to um, to AI and see how those two entities could could collaborate and um, compose something with each other. So that was a, a very, very fabulous process um, with hours of recording singers, um, the Radican specifically, who was also like a, um, a very gifted singer and just trying to see how this model that was trained on his own data could react and then respond to himself in live environments. Um, so yes, that, that's how everything sort of started really. So yeah, we've been following the, the tracks of, of the body mm -hmm. you know, up to these uh, levels of complexity and, and following the tracks of the body, I'm, uh, I'm going to show this one image here um, of Mark Vives, who joined us uh, slightly after we began the, the talk, but he's here. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if we can like add a chair, or maybe I can I can leave my chair to Mark. Mark, te puedo llamar aquí a que cuentes algo de la, de la pieza. So Mark suffered from the delayed. Uh, trains and uh, finally made it from the Basque country. See on the sand. Where you can see. No, para nada. Porque la gente que que quiera preguntar. Bueno, esta vez. Hola. No, no me imaginaba estar hablando aquí y. Casi me da un paro cardíaco pensando que lo tenía que hacer además en inglés. Eh, pero habría salido algo. Entonces, a ver, no sé muy bien qué explicar. De hecho, hace mucho que no lo explico. Bueno, tu pieza eh, fundamentalmente es una performance natatoria en la que cantas y aullas y ululas. Y en cierto momento, cuando tienes una cierta cantidad de material, pones ese material en manos de un algoritmo que produce un montaje, ¿no? Más uh -huh. o menos... Bueno, cuéntanos cómo fue ese, esa colaboración, si se puede llamar así. Casi me sale bien y la introducción ha hecho que lo expliques tú. Eh, pues eh, sí, básicamente, bueno, viene de, pues de cierta... cierta eh, estaba ahora pensando eh, cosas cuando estaba ahí sentado y digo, mierda, me, va, me van a hacer hablar. Eh, pues sí, o sea, como dices, es esto, ¿no? Es una... Tú empezaste nadando, ¿no? Eh, empezaste nadando. Largas longitudes de, de no. la Costa Brava, ¿no? Sí, y no cantando. tanto. Yo, empe yo empecé nadando en, en, en Donosti, porque vivía allí, luego me mudé a... Bueno, me mudé. Volví a Barcelona por cosas personales y ahí descubrí que podía seguir nadando. 
Y entonces, eh, pues me, me, tenía este, este hábito, ¿no? Que me duró relativamente poco, pero iba a diario. Y de ahí, pues vi que el hábitat este de estar en el, en el mar era lo más parecido que yo tenía a un, al trabajo de, de estudio, ¿no? De ir al taller, ¿no? Porque pues no lo, no lo he tenido, no lo he sentido nunca así, ¿no? Como no he trabajado nunca de esa manera. Y ahí, pues realmente, pues no, pues no tengo escapatoria, ¿no? O sea, si estoy en un estudio, pues me pongo nervioso, me inquieto, eh, no sé, es como que busco resultados, ¿no? Y entonces, pues en el, en, el, en el mar no me queda otra, ¿no? Que estar ahí y, y de lo que salía de ahí, pues bueno, aún tenía pues alguna tarea más que hacer en, en casa, ¿no? Como, bueno, pues secar la ropa, eh, sacar el, no sé, la tarjeta de la GoPro y cosas así muy elementales. Pero bueno, estas cosas, ¿no? Eh, igual me paso a veces de como de, de seco con las cosas. Y, y nada, pues eh, en, esta, en esta cuestión y de sentir ahí este trabajo que ya estaba haciendo, ¿no? Con la voz, sobre todo. En, la, en primera instancia fue como en comunicación con una montaña que hay en Barcelona. Pero luego pensé en cambiar el paisaje y ahí, eh, bueno, pues aparecieron eso, lo que decía Manuel, ¿no? Menos palabras y más como ruidos, ¿no? Y, y pues eso, como para lenguajes, ¿no? Como risas, eh, aullidos, eh, cosas que podrían ser eh, pues animales, máquinas, cualquier otra, ¿no? Y reaccionando al, al paisaje, aunque digo reaccionando y muchas veces no lo sé, porque a veces pues la melodía o, el, o, es, o esos ruidos o esos ritmos aparecen de, de estar nadando y no de parar y de, y de reaccionar a algo. O sea, que a veces están ahí y, y aparecen. Entonces, no, hay, no es como la leyenda de un mapa, ¿no? Que, que las cosas, ¿no? Si veo un hotel, gruño, ¿no? Y si veo un... Si hace mal tiempo, eh, pues me enfado. Y, o estoy más contento porque hace sol y me da en la cara. O sea, como que no hay una equivalencia, eh, sino que hay un poco el estar ahí, ¿no? Y, y bueno, y este trabajo con la voz sí que viene de bastante para atrás, ¿no? Quiero decir, ese sí que es un trabajo que yo he, pues he ido como madurando y bueno, pues me sale, no sé cómo, ni sé hacia dónde va, pero me, pero me sale. Y estoy en ello, o sea que de hecho es un proceso que empieza en el 19, 19, 20 y que, y que creo que empieza a condensarse ahora y a ver ahora, os empiezo a ver ahora que a lo mejor sé por dónde voy pero todavía no me atrevo a, a contároslo. Y esa decisión de que el montaje se ha hecho algorítmicamente, sí. que, que las decisiones no las tomes tú en ese punto... Sí, la verdad es que me, me daba bastante... Pan. O sea, quiero decir, como, como bien decías, para mí es una performance, ¿no? Quiero decir, no, para mí no es un, no un vídeo. El, el vídeo es como un testimonio, es como una especie de prueba de que ha pasado algo ahí en el agua, ¿no? Entonces, el, el hecho de estar ahí editando del, delante de un timeline, ¿no? Y ir cortando y decidiendo este trozo sí, este trozo no, la verdad es que no me... No me, me, me destruía toda la posibilidad de, de hacer algo con eso. Y, bueno, ya apareció esto, ¿no? Como pues, el trabajo con, con patches, con algoritmos que que sin entrenarlos, tal como venían, eh, discriminaba lo que era voz humana, voz humana en un nivel como matemático, ¿no? de lo que no era, ¿no? de lo que no es voz humana. Entonces, el vídeo, digamos, pues yo pues iba a nadar y cuando decidí que el vídeo se podía eh, procesar, pues, eh, pues lo metimos en esa máquina y lo escupió de una manera, lo retocamos eh, previamente, hicimos muchas pruebas de, de cómo definir ese, ese cortado, pero básicamente lo que hace es eso, como distinguir la voz humana de lo que no es humano. Y, y, hay, y hay cosas que no son mi voz, pero que se cuelan ahí porque parecen voz, ¿no? Porque de repente es un, un chasquido en el agua, ¿no? Y hay cosas ahí que, bueno, pues que están ahí y se cuelan, ¿no? Pero para mí es, hacerlo de esa manera era, la, era casi como editar en, en vivo, ¿no? O sea, yo iba con la cámara aquí, nadaba, entonces cantaba. Entonces sabía que cuando cantaba eso iba a entrar, ¿no? Igual entraban más cosas o recortaba algunas cosas que parecían que son voz pero que, no, que luego no las, no las cogía porque pensaba que eran otras cosas. Pero bueno, la cuestión es que yo ahí podía editar, ¿no? Como en el, en el agua. Eh, entonces, pues yo nadaba 10 minutos, cantaba 2, nadaba 10, cantaba 2 o nadaba un minuto, eh, cantaba, paraba un minuto, ¿no? O sea... Si lo iba, de, depende de cómo quería hacerlo, pues eh, estaba ahí editando, ¿no? Tenía un ritmo, tenía un paisaje, en el vídeo aparecen unas cosas u otras. 
Entonces yo, desta, yo decidí ahí, ¿no? O sea, luego sí que es verdad que hay un trabajo de postproducción, pero en el que yo realmente eh, declino toda la responsabilidad. Porque ya la he hecho antes, ¿no? Quiero decir, no porque no lo quiera... O sea, sí, no lo quería hacer, de verdad, no lo quería hacer, pero esa, eso está hecho para que sea una performance. Y creo que no puedo explicar mucho más. Bueno, para mí esa, este trabajo es, podría estar vivo, quiero decir, que podría seguir o volver a nadar a algunas playas y... Y ya está, no, no tenía otra, era siempre la hacía de norte a sur, entraba en un lugar, salía en otro. O sea, la mecánica era muy simple. Y eso. Y tampoco las distancias eran tan largas ahí. Yo creo que estaba una hora como mucho, no soy un gran nadador. Lo he exagerado un poco, pero para darte ese aire sí. heroico. Sí, claro, pero luego, está... luego la gente que nada me dice, bueno, Mar, a ver cuándo vamos a nadar. Yeah. Entonces ahí se, ahí se ve todo. <risa> Gracias, Marc. Eh, pues qué bien haberte podido ir pese al tema del tren porque sí que contábamos contigo porque yo creo que esto nos dibuja un arco bastante completo ¿no? de, de, de la exposición, aunque no son todos los artistas ni todas las artistas. Eh, creo que hay algo como un, un espacio con, 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 con múltiples aspectos, pero que no es exactamente un polidro, es, algo, es una figura un poco monstruosa eh, que... Que, que, que bueno, que cuenta lo que pasa en este espacio, creo que es mejor ir a verlo. Veo a Salón Me Cuesta que me está sonriendo y poniéndole eso un dedito al reloj. Así que, um, a ver, como tampoco somos muchos, pues diría que, um, que hablemos en la exposición directamente y nos tomamos algo y, y todo eso, ¿no? Um, I propose that since we're not so many, we can go to the show, have a drink, talk. And uh, unless somebody wants to add something to to this moment of the debate, but since uh, Salome is reminding us that we need to get to the gallery and perhaps wait for the rector. Okay. Well, well. Thank you to everybody here, to the team at the UPV, to the artists, of course, to the team of An Idea, and to everybody who helped organize the show. Um, we're very happy, Rosa and myself, um, of all the work in the show. We 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 will hope you. You'll really enjoy it. Gracias a todas y a todos. Ha sido una, una pasada trabajar y nada, que disfrutes la expo.